Shalom, shalom, and welcome to Kingdom Treasures, the teaching ministry of Messianic teacher Rav Angus Marichaud, the founder of Shekinah Restoration Messianic Fellowship. Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the world, says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid, then in his joy goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Matthew 13, 44 We believe that Yeshua proclaimed, prioritized, and personified the powerful and in-breaking reign of the kingdom of the God of Israel, first to the lost sheep of the family of Israel, then to all nations. The Hebraic perspective is a golden key that unlocks the treasures of Holy Scripture. May you be enriched and equipped through kingdom treasures. And now, with today's teaching, here is Rav Angus Marichaud. Now to the King Eternal. Now to the King Eternal. Immortal, invisible, the only God, to him be honor, glory, and dominion, before time, now, and forever. Amen, be amen. Shalom, shalom, beloved, in the precious merit of Yeshua, we come with a message of hope, message of the kingdom, the message of repentance, the message of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, breaking into space and time through Yeshua, the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. He is here, he is among us, as it is written, he is the same yesterday today and forever so let us acknowledge him let's open our hearts and minds to receive from king messiah that the rock Hakodesh, the holy spirit of god speak to us and impact us and and enable us to be courageous as we become influencers as we become carriers of the attitudes of the kingdom as we become instigators of a kingdom culture as we step out and do the will of rabbi yeshua today by god's love and grace i will speak to us on the theme the kingdom culture the kingdom culture. And as a text, we're in uh, Matthew chapter 5. That's a text on the uh, discussion. So you want to look with me to Matthew chapter 5. You're going to be going through Matthew 5, 1 to 16. This is the message of, of Rabbi Jesus, Rabbi Yeshua. And we want to look at it. So we, the theme of the message is a kingdom culture. So we look at Matthew chapter 5 from verse 1. Master of the universe, open our eyes to behold wonderful things out of your scriptures and speak to us with the living God through your servant, through your son, Yeshua HaMashiach. So verse 1 says, when Yeshua saw the crowds, when Yeshua saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Now, when we read the scriptures, we are reading to, to, to understand who our master is. Who is this one who loves us and washed us from our sins and who has saved us and who is now wrapping himself in a talit of light, sitting down to teach us? So here what we see, Yeshua saw the crowd. So multitudes were following him. He saw the crowds and look what he did. He went up on the mountain. That is a Kesha, a connection to Moses going up on the mountain. So he's drawing that parallel, all right? So just as God wrapped himself in a talit, and sat down on Mount Sinai and taught Israel in the same way the master is doing. So when he sat down as a rabbi, you, you sit down and teach, right? So he sat down and his disciples came to him. Notice he didn't say the crowds came to him. We normally assume he was speaking to the crowds, but no brethren, he was speaking to his disciples. He moved away from the crowds. So go with me, if you will, to, Ma to Luke chapter 14. And let's pick that up. Luke chapter 14, you see every word of scripture, it's important, and by God's spirit, he will explain them to us, all right? So Luke chapter 14, verse 25, look, look at this. Now, large crowds were going along with him. Notice again, large crowds. And he turned and said to them, so he's speaking now to the crowd. Look what he said. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So you're in the crowd, but you want to be my disciple? You need to understand. I am calling upon you to love. Whoever does not carry his own cross and, and come after me cannot be my disciple. You think the master is making it difficult, challenging to be our disciple? He's drawing you out from the crowd into discipleship. But which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has 
laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it began to ridicule him, mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sees, uh, when, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks the terms of shalom. So then, in the like manner, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all. Give up all. His own possessions. Mm. Therefore, salt is good. But, if, but even salt... But if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It's just thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So the master wants us to hear what he's saying by the spirit. Crowds are following, but he turns and speaks because he knows to be a disciple of Rabbi Jesus, Rabbi Yeshua of Nazareth, you have to count the cost. But can I submit to you, not only is he telling his disciples, potential Talmudim, to count the cost, he is also counting the cost. Did you hear me right? He is counting the cost. In other words, Yeshua is saying, listen, I am going to count the cost. 30 years being in Nazareth, three years of popularity, the scandal, the hatred, the agony of Gethsemane, the onslaught of Golgotha. I'm going to count the cost because no one is going to ridicule me when I am about to build. He's counting the cost. Normally we look at it as us counting the cost. No, it is he counting the cost. And because he has counted the cost and say, listen, I understand what this is going to take. And I'm going to give my all because he has done it. Then Baruch Hashem, bless me God. You and I can now count the cost and do likewise. So the master is saying to us, they're searching conditions that he's calling us to he's searching because see brethren he's building for eternity and the stakes are high so he tells us you cannot be my disciple you cannot be my disciple you cannot be my as if he's trying to whittle the crowd down because you see the, as i said the stakes are high it is his building enterprise that we're involved in and those who love him personally passionately and devotedly Beyond the closest relatives on earth, they will be my disciples. Now, are you still wanting to be a disciple? The crowds, you would love your closest ties, and you should do that. But to be a disciple of the master, he's saying, I would also call upon you to recognize, you have to put me first, above your closest ties. He's whittling down the crowd. The stakes are high. It's a stern requirement. Oh, but what a glorious kingdom and what a glorious master. He's given us an opportunity. So he's coming here as a building inspector. He said, listen, this is, this is my building enterprise. I'm a building inspector and I will inspect how you build because I have counted the cost and I have built. And if you're going to build on top of my foundation, you too have the counted the cost because I have counted the cost. I understood going through three years and the agony of Gethsemane and the agony of Golgotha. I've come to the cost. And now that I've come to the cost, I can build. I can overcome. I can be a disciple to the end. I will not lose my saltiness. I've come to the cost. We have to hear. Are we going to be a disciple of Rav Yeshua? Or are we going to be following from a distance? Are we going to be in the crowd? He's speaking to his disciples, disciplined ones who would follow him. And so he's saying to us again, it's going to cost. He comes, as I said, he inspects. You see, I've come to realize that people will not necessarily do what I expect, but they will more likely do what I inspect. So as a parent, you have to inspect. You can't just, well, I expect my children to not go on pornography sites. I expect that. Uh huh. You have to inspect also. You have to trust. Yes, I trust you, but I also verify. It is foolish to say, well, I trust, and you don't verify. You are expecting, but you have to inspect also because the master inspects. If you want to build, I'm going to inspect. What are you building with? Are you building with the same spirit with which I built, where I counted the cost 
and I realize the kingdom is everything, and I give up everything for the kingdom. If you are going to be following me as my disciples, you have to count the cost. So take heed how you build. Because I am a searching God. And I'm not like other building inspectors who would take a bribe and pass. No. If you're not measuring up, I will tell you you're not measuring up and give you an opportunity to get it right. Because this building, this construction is a building for eternity. And you can't build with stubble and hay. It wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't last the fire. And so God is saying to us, listen, go with me to Matthew 13. Matthew chapter 13. He's given us pictures of the kingdom in Matthew chapter 13. Uh, we, we're talking about the, 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 the message of the kingdom. And Matthew chapter 13, the master is illustrating the kingdom. He's illustrating the kingdom. So look at this word picture that he gives us. Remember? It's the kingdom culture. So verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all. Notice that theme, selling all that he has and buys that field. He goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. That's a word picture, brethren. That is showing us the unimaginable value and worth of the kingdom. When you stumble upon the king and the kingdom and the joy of being invited to the kingdom, you will sell everything. The cost of discipleship you will pay readily because you have encountered the king and you know the value of the kingdom. And you'll recognize that nothing in this world could compare to the value and imaginable worth of the kingdom. That's why you would give up all, even your own life, even your family members, love to them. Because you have counted the cost and you're building upon him who has counted the cost. Yeshua the Messiah. When you find that joy, nothing becomes too difficult. Because the kingdom that he's given you, what shall a man give? What, what, what paternal, maternal sibling relationship could hold you back from the king? And if it's holding you back, then you cannot be his disciple. Stay in the crowd. Stay in the crowd and wave at me. But you're not going to be in my inner circle of disciples. You're not yet ready for that. You're still too earthbound. You're still too tied. Those who would follow me must love me above all else. Even above life itself. This is the king calling us. So go with me to Luke chapter 6, verse 20. As you joyfully seek uh, 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 he will provide every need for us, right? But we're counting the cost because we're understanding the kingdom of heaven is everything. To, 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 to the Messiah, the kingdom of heaven is everything. That's why he keeps telling us, sell all, sell all, sell all. Don't hold anything back because the kingdom is everything and it demands everything and more. The kingdom is expensive and it's going gonna, it's gonna to require everything that we have and everything that we are and more. Because it is a kingdom, an eternal kingdom that spans eternity of eternities. So in Luke chapter 6, verse 20, we see this. And turning his gaze towards the disciples, he began to say, notice, he turned his gaze away from the crowd and he's speaking to disciples. So if you're here on this line listening, it may be that you're a disciple. Or it may be that you're in the crowd. And you're being a, 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 a curious a, a, a inquirer. In your mind, let me give this Yeshua thing a try. He might be just a good teacher. So let me hear what he has to say. Go with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 from verse 16. Acts chapter 17 from verse 16. Now, while, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he observing the city full of idols. This was a very religious city, very religious city. All right. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews. All right. Who understood the concept of the kingdom and God fearing Gentiles like, like Cornelius who are coming into the kingdom. And he's reasoning in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be present. 
providentially. And also some of the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seemed to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Yeshua and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the area of Pagas, saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming? For you are bringing some strange thing to our ears. So we want to know what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. Are you understanding? Paul is coming into a place where they spend their time in, 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 in giving their opinions, in embracing philosophies. Well, I feel this, and I think this, and this is how I see it. This is the kingdom of Elohim. And he's coming to us, and he's telling us that same thing. He's saying to us, listen, you have all your concepts about who you think I am, all your philosophies of life, but I'm coming to break through with the message of the kingdom. I'm here to tell you, Yeshua is not going to allow you to accommodate him in his life. This is the king of the universe. He will have no other gods beside him. Remember what the Philistines did? They took the ark of God and brought it into the temple of Dagon, and the Dagon fell. Why? You can't have Jesus and. You can't have the gospel and. He is Lord of all or not Lord at all. Make up your mind. Come out of the valley of decision. Multitudes, multitudes. Let me give this thing a try. Let me hear this new thing. Let me see if this will titillate my senses and I will decide whether or not I want to accept it. You are not fit for the kingdom. Stay with your philosophies and let that deliver you in the day of trouble. But for those who recognize that he is all, will internalize, hide this, and recognize I can't keep it silent, so they go and sell everything to invest in the kingdom. This is total buying, not, no, no curious uh, 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 inquiry here, all right? He's not just one among the gods of others, as I said, all right? You, you're not going to admire him, but not submit to him. He's not just a good teacher, one of the many good teachers. No, you're not ready for the message of the kingdom. The kingdom is cheap to you. You have not encountered that treasure yet. You're still thinking in human terms. How many of us would like, love to stumble upon treasure? Think about how that feels. That's why he used that to, to tell us. Think about how you would feel if you stumble upon treasure. You weren't expecting it and then boom, treasure. Oh my God, how would your life change? Some of us would, well, okay, stop working one time, pay off all my day. All these things, your life changes because you've stumbled upon treasure. That's what he's telling us. When you stumble by his providence against this treasure, you sell everything. Your life changes. And if it hasn't changed, then you have not genuinely, authentically encountered the king. And you cheapen his kingdom by putting him alongside. And so, Go with me to John chapter 16. John chapter 16, in the book of John. I want to submit to you, refusing Messiah is the crowning sin of sins. Can I say that again? Refusing to accept that Yeshua of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, the Son of the living God, the light of revelation to the nations, the glory of my people Israel, the savior of the world. Not accepting him is the greatest of sins. It is the crowning sin of sins. Refusing him. Look with me at John chapter 16, verse 8. And when he, the spirit of God, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they believe not on me. What is the greatest sin in the world? That the world does not believe that Yeshua HaMashiach is the son of the living God. He is a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's a sin in the world. So if that is the crumbling sin, then the greatest blessing in the world is receiving him as who he says he is and who he is in truth, the son of the living God. Because if he is who he says he is, then you've entered a turning point. There's no turning back. You are in the cul-de-sac of his will. If he is who he says he is, and he is, then there is no turning back. 
It's either he makes you glad or he makes you mad. But you have to decide. You see, the gospel is about challenging people to decide for him on this side of eternity. Because there's coming a day when there's no more time to decide. So life is given to you to decide. And having decided, you make good your decision by selling all and buying that field and, and trying to unwrap this treasure that you have gotten. Because it's going to take eternity of eternities to unwrap that treasure, to understand the value of that treasure. The treasure is priceless. The treasure is beyond imagination. This treasure is beyond this world. And when you encounter him, you will sell all. So this is the sin. Quote me to John chapter 12, verse 32. John chapter 12. When, when we hear this, it, 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 it can be quite challenging for us, but John 12, 32 tells us this. He says, I, if I am lifted up, speaking about his death on the cross, you know, some of, us, some of us have this song and we sing, uh, lift up Jesus, lift him higher, lift him higher. But he's talking here about his crucifixion. He said, if I am lifted up from the earth, speaking about his, 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 his crucifixion, not his ascension. All right. In this case, he said, if I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. If I am lifted up, if I die, if I fulfill the will of my father, I will draw all men to myself. Can you see what's happening here? The cross brought all men to itself, to Messiah. In the cross, there's a potential for salvation. All men come. Can you see that? God so loved the world that he gave. The cross draws all men. Because all men have been spoken as dead. Because there's none righteous. No, not one. So the cross brings us, the cross, can I say, is inclusive. Yet, beloved, can I tell you, only those who believe and repent enters into the kingdom. So the cross is inclusive, but the kingdom is exclusive. The cross will be for the crowds. The kingdom is for the disciples. Not because you have accepted him as your savior means that you are walking as a disciple. Because he says, unless you are born again, unless you are born again, go with me to John chapter 3. He's given out exclusivity. This is the kingdom now. John chapter 3, verse 3. Yes, you answered and said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, born from above, experience a transformation, experience the resurrected power of the living God, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Or unless you're born of water and the spirit, you cannot see, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So there are many believers who are saved, have come to the cross, but as far as kingdom citizen and kingdom walking, clueless, even though they may profess that I am born again, there is no transform transforming power of the resurrection in our lives. And so that's what Jesus is saying to us. You see, I believe we have to begin to understand the kingdom is exclusive. God chose Israel and he's king over Israel. I need to explain to us, listen, only them who accept him as his son and doing what he's saying that we should do are part of his kingdom. Hmm. There's a difference between God's sovereignty over the world as creator and over Israel as it were, as his elect. Israel is called elect because Israel has accepted God's rule. I'm talking about for the most part. Think about at, at Mount Sinai. Israel said, we will do. A select, elect nation, holy. So there, his sovereignty and his kingship, two different things. Can I say that to you? God is sovereign over all. But he's not Lord of all. You see the difference? God's sovereignty is universal. He will judge all. But his kingdom is particular. 
universal, particular. God's sovereignty is unconditional. The kingdom is conditional. God's sovereignty is inescapable. Sorry, yes, in inescapable, but the kingdom is volitional. So we're seeing God is sovereign of all, and as judge of all, he will judge. Whether we like it or not, he will judge. But when we choose to submit to him as king and take upon ourselves the yoke of the kingdom every day, that's when we say the Shema, we take upon ourselves the yoke of the kingdom. We are making him king, and now we are doing what he wants us to do. You see, God redeemed us from Israel. He redeemed Israel from Egypt, right? Brought us to Sinai and gave us revelation. Now we have a responsibility to walk it out. Did, did, did you get that? Let me go back and tell us that again. God, you see, there's redemption, revelation, responsibility. You get that? Redemption, revelation, responsibility. God redeemed Israel out of Egypt. Redemption. Brought us to Sinai. Gave us revelation. This is who I am. This is my kingdom culture. And now we have the corresponding responsibility to walk it out. In the same way, when the master redeemed us from the law of sin and death, he gave us revelation of who he is and who we are not and who we ought to be. And then we have a responsibility to walk it out. Why? Responsibility is our response to his empowering ability in us to walk out the kingdom. Can I say that again? Responsibility is our response to his divine ability in you and I to walk out. We are responsible. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Haven't been redeemed. Haven't revelation. Now we are responsible to go do what he says. Go with Thank you for sharing Kingdom Treasures, the enriching and equipping teaching ministry of Rav Angus Marichal. For more Hebraic insight, please visit our YouTube channel at Rav Angus Marichal or Facebook at Shikina Restoration Messianic Fellowship. Message us at srmf.tt at gmail.com. May you continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Master, Rabbi, and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. The blessing of Adonai be upon you. We bless you in the name of Adonai. Grace and Shalom Shalom. Mm -hmm.